Um, started working with the university to pull together this event. One of the things that we realized is that um, it's very common for a lot of scientists to get into a room together and talk about issues like ocean acidification. But those conversations are often lacking the people, the businesses, and the communities and community members uh, who potentially are um, in the line of fire and will be impacted. So um, for that purpose, uh, we put together a stakeholder panel um, to talk about those issues, about the, the people and the places um, who may potentially be impacted by ocean acidification and the realities of what this means for us and for our communities. Uh, so to head up this panel, um, we have uh, State Representative Holly Rasheen, who we are very lucky not only to have here today leading this panel, um, but we are lucky to have her as a champion for the University of Miami and as a champion for ocean and coastal issues. So, Holly, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And how uh, exciting, and my gosh, my brain is going about a thousand miles a minute right now on all the uh, information that we learned from the scientific community. And I wish that I could clone that presentation and probably this whole day and take it to Tallahassee with me and educate my colleagues because. Oh, oh, good. Excellent. That's right. We're being recorded. Well, um, so I have to watch what I say. But um, this is just incredible. And the just hearing, you know, I have the honor of representing the Florida Keys in the state legislature. I also represent the southern portion of Miami-Dade County. So I think I have one of the most diverse districts in the state of Florida. And it's so great to hear um, you know, but about the, the science and, and here the Florida Keys and here Monroe County and how much attention is being paid to this very, very important subject. And it's something that in, um, in the next year or so that I hope to take to Tallahassee to educate um, the governor, to educate, I, I'm sure his agencies are kind of on top of this, but to educate my colleagues as well that we need to really be in front of this. Um, it's going to be an issue for our children, our grandchildren, for generations to come, and what are the things that we can do on a statewide level to help combat OA, right? Is that the PC, OA? <laughs> yes, uh, ocean acidification. So um, just from my perspective or from the legislative perspective, I'm really excited to start working on this and maybe mimic something similar to what they are doing in the state of Washington because they are seeing firsthand the devastating effects on their oyster fisheries. We've heard about what's going on in Maine with the lobster fishery. And uh, I'm so excited to hear from our stakeholders today, ranging from the dive industry, the tourism guru, guru and of course, uh, the fishing industry. So with that, gentlemen, do you want to, uh, Mr. Talbert, do you want to maybe just start and we'll go down the line, just introduce yourself and maybe why you're here today. Uh, thank you very much, Representative. I'd like to say that Alaska's loss was Florida's gain, so <laughs> welcome, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, I am Bill Talbert. I'm President and CEO of the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. Anybody ever heard of that organization? Yeah, yeah. of course. Oh, good. Uh, I'm a Florida native. I was born in Jacksonville and actually grew up in the Atlantic Ocean in Jacksonville Beach. We, we uh, as little tykes, uh, we were the original skimmers and surfers and you know, we never wore sunscreen or anything, and we lived in the water, literally, day and night. So uh, I grew up, I went to a, a small school in the central part of the state of Florida, the University of Florida. I don't know, anybody heard of that? Huh? Huh? Who oh, no. What? What's that? I know. <laughs> I, and we're at UM. I, uh, I know. It's okay. Well, you know, there you go. Uh, uh, a couple of things, actually, the kind of, I feel like the little fish, by the way. We heard the little fish. Earlier, somebody talking about the little fish. I feel like the little fish. Uh, actually, in two weeks, I'll become uh, chair of the Visit Florida Board, uh, which would be good statewide. Excellent. Congrats. Uh, and was appointed last uh, Friday by the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Secretary Pritzker, to the Travel and Tourism Advisory Board. And so don't tell my board I'm doing these other things. So, But uh, we, we stay uh, very busy. Uh, while I wasn't, a, we did catch catfish in Jacksonville, surf fishing. Uh, and uh, I have fished here, and uh, let me just give you some, some basic numbers. Well, uh, one thing, uh, when I was called about this session, I got to be honest with you, I've never heard of ocean acidification. Never, ever, ever. Now, I, I'm well read. I know I went to public school in Jacksonville, but I, uh, <laughs> uh, I consider myself up global warming, 
heard of global warming, but ocean acidification, never. I had to go to Google. I talked to the Voice of America folks. Is Voice of America here, somebody? But uh, I had to go to Google to find out. One thing I would recommend, get a new name. Have a, ha no, I'm serious, I'm serious. Uh, get some branding company to go out and give you a new name, ocean acidification. Well, that's something to get behind. Is that good or bad? I don't know. So that's, uh, uh, that's it. So I can tell you, well, that, that's me, and I'll get back into the importance of the, the beach uh, to our industry, travel and tourism. My, I'm paid. That's for, in the subset, um, um, substance of uh, your question coming up, so uh, that's good. So Save it. I'll, I'll get to that. Thank Got you it. for listening. And Eric. Uh, good morning, guys. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the University of Miami, especially in the Rasmus School. Uh, my name is Eric Cartaya. I represent Divers Paradise. We're a scuba diving operation and charter business that's been here on Key Biscayne right across the cut uh, since 1987 and been in business uh, since 1978. So uh, I'm a born and raised in Miami, too. Lived in the water as a diver as we are a family-run organization. And I've had the opportunity to work with um, Dr. Neil Hammerschlag, Dr. Christopher Langdon, Dr. Uh, Diego Lerman, and many other people here with UM. We share such a, a, a unique area. Um, I'm very vested in the coral reef system in and around us, both from an economic standpoint, but I also have two young children who live here on Key Biscayne. Um, so for me, it was a great honor to be a part of uh, this discussion panel. Uh, I get to see the reef uh, with my eyes um, uh, very often as opposed to through a sonar or a depth chart. And um, so it's very important for me to make sure that we have kind of an understanding, uh, a general layman understanding of what's going on, how it's impacting our reefs, um, and also getting the outreach out. And I believe that through fishing boats and dive boats, we can really inform um, the average uh, consumer as to what's going on and how they can make an impact. Um, you know, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Lerman, uh, we've started to uh, outplant and outcrop a staghorn coral back onto the reef systems uh, here in, in uh, the upper tract uh, near Fowey and, and points further north. So um, that's it. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and I'll pass it on. Excellent. And Ray? Uh, my name's Ray Rocher. Uh, uh, again, born in Miami, so is my father, and I've uh, been a full-time fishing guide for almost 40 years commercial fish for 30-something years. Uh, of course, enjoy recreational fishing with my family and uh, actually fished near Ernie for many years down in the Keys. And i um, happy to be a part of this panel and learn more about it, ocean acidification. I also didn't know much about it or anything about it, to be honest with you. And, and uh, you know, due to the efforts of lots of kind people have, have shared information. And, and education, I, I'd say, is the thing that needs to happen the most because um, I would venture to say that very, very few fishermen know anything about it, and I see this across the board with fisheries issues. In the last two weeks, I've represented fishermen in uh, uh, two other you know, South Atlantic Council meeting two days ago and in in another fisheries matter earlier in the month, and the thing that I see over and over is that most fishermen by nature are independent. That's why they're fishermen. They like kind of being, uh, goes back to the pirate days, I think. You know, <laughs> the breeze in your hair, and, you know. Anyways, uh, by nature, I think most fishermen are not um, very communal. And uh, I, think, I think Ernie can report on that in the Keys. <laughs> There's always some drama going on. Anyways, it's just, and it goes on everywhere. But the point is, they don't communicate well. And through um, a group effort, I think maybe we can help bring awareness to our to uh, not only the people that we come in contact with in the fishing business, we run about 500 charters a year between our three boats. And um, education on that level could be good. And also, um, I've started a nonprofit organization called SAFE, South Atlantic Fish Fishing Environmentalists, that represents recreational, commercial, and, and charter industry. Uh, Really, the primary goal of that organization is education, letting people know what's going on in the world of legislation, letting them know what's going on in environmental issues, et cetera, trying to fill that gap. So that's really my story. Excellent. And Ernie, we'll round up with you. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here. 
Um, I guess I'm the only one who wasn't born in Florida. I was born in New Jersey. I moved down here when I was 13 years old to the Florida Keys, went to school down there, graduated, fished down there, um, worked in the fish houses down there, and started making my living down there. I've been, I'm starting on my 33rd year of commercial fishing in the Florida Keys. Um, I'm president of the Florida Keys Commercial Fishermen's mm -hmm. Association. I've been on the Biscayne National Park Working Group, uh, Sanctuary um, Zoning Advisory Panel, and president of the Florida Keys Commercial Fishermen's Association for four years, and um, I'm a member for 14 years. And um, I didn't, like, like these other, I didn't know anything about the ocean acidification until the 15th of last month, so I'm getting educated a lot about what's happening with the acidification. We're into a lot of coral protection. You know, we've worked with, you know, the Sanctuary and the South Atlantic Council on, you know, proposing 60 coral protection areas to keep our traps away from the coral and to protect the coral. So we're highly involved with this, and I'm looking forward to learning more about this. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, Mr. Talbert, we're going to start with you. Uh, you how can much call me Bill. It's okay, fine. Bill. Okay. Well, I wasn't sure. You said it's more formal. Representative. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just call me Holly. Okay. Um, how much does tourism of uh, the coral reefs and ocean environments support other Florida businesses? Well, I can't, I can't drill down on that specifically, but I can tell you in our business, we uh, conduct 400 surveys uh, every month uh, throughout our community and talk to our visitor. Our visitor, whether they're here for a vacation or for uh, business or meetings and convention or a cruise. So I can tell you uh, that's a $24 billion business. In uh, Now, when I say Miami, I mean Miami-Dade County. So north, south, east, and west, the entire county. Uh, and we're the, we're the official destination sales and marketing organization for uh, our entire community. City of Miami, Coral Gables, Miami Beach, Homestead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, we uh, ask our customers what, what they like and what they don't like. And the most mentioned like quality about our community has been for years, 59% of all of our visitors, when asked that question, what do they like? They like the beaches. Now we have 25 miles of beaches in this, in this community. And so are these visitors, uh, 85% are here for a vacation, 7% our principal purpose of visit is a cruise, but uh, the beaches is number one, 25 miles of beaches. And we became very, I mean, very, very familiar, more intimately with the beaches during the Gulf oil spill. Anybody remember the Gulf oil spill? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I you know? Forget. It was mm -hmm. over there, so we, uh, we got up to speed on that very quickly, and uh, thank God, we. We only found oil one time on the Miami beaches. We found a, uh, found, found a bottle of uh, tanning oil. So that's, uh, that's the only, it made the news, by the way. But uh, so we, we don't have data on fishing, but we do know that the beaches is, now we have beaches and we have weather, but, uh, and, and we also have evolved our program uh, as many other destinations. You have to distinguish yourself from the competition. There are lots of communities around the world with beaches. We got wonderful, beautiful beaches, and we got wonderful weather, but there are a lot of places that do that. We've involved, kind of afraid, we're more than a beach now, we're great beaches, but we're art and culture and neighborhoods and, and lots, lots of great things. But uh, clearly the, the beaches are important, and what happens in the water is important. So that uh, I'm on the learning uh, as well, and uh, I look forward to working with you in Tallahassee. Excellent. And Eric, we'll move on to you. Um, what do healthy coral reefs do for Florida citizens, in your opinion? Well, I think as was discussed in the panel by scientists earlier, obviously there's a, a system or kind of a, a correlated effect on the beaches and on the overall ecosystem uh, to the reefs. But more specific uh, to diving uh, and maybe that industry, and I know that they obviously help create uh, fish populations that, that keep the fishing industry going, I think it's important, uh, although we're here in Key Biscayne, to think about you know the Florida Keys as well as being a major mecca for Florida Keys diving destination, and I can speak to that because you know uh, I don't know how many times a month I'll hear, oh I didn't know there was diving in Miami, <laughs> just I thought you go to the Keys, right? Yeah. And, um, and then I'll have scientists tell me, well, yeah, Key Biscayne isn't really a key. I'm like, yeah, but don't tell anybody that. <laughs> just, you know, it's the first key, right? Yeah. So, um, 
you know, you, you hear the news about what's going on in the Great Barrier Reef and you see the impact that it's had on kind of an iconic uh, uh, location and uh, you see what impact it has there. And I think that if you, if you include the Florida Keys and the market uh, and the economy that's created by the reefs in that area, uh, it has a major impact on um, people who drive down to the Keys and businesses in the Keys, uh, uh, most definitely. Um, I think it's important to, to realize, and this is something that I see, I don't think people in Miami particularly really uh, are much when it comes to, uh, you know, divers. They're not real, they're, they're more city, uh, people who come for South Beach, for Miami, for, for the event town, and maybe some people come out and do a dive. So I think one of the biggest uh, areas of, of importance is looking at how we can educate the South Florida population, not really the Keys, because mm -hmm. they're kind of, you know, that's preaching to the choir, right? But the Miami, South Florida area about the reef system that we have, and then maybe that will kind of spill over into the Keys, just bring awareness to it. I, I think that that's the most important thing because people are unaware. I, I live on Key Biscayne, and I would venture to say there's a pretty good percentage of people who live on the Key who never go to the beach. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who live in Miami who don't venture out on boats. So I think there's a lack of awareness, and I think that that's real. We need to let people know that there is this beautiful thing two and a half miles offshore. So that would be my point. Great, great response. And um, to remind people that we are home to the third largest reef track in the okay. world. In the world. That's a pretty big deal. So great, great input, uh, in, input. Ray, what do visitors want to see and do when they hire you as a guide? How important are healthy oceans for their goals? Well, of course, the, the obvious uh, goal is they want to go catch fish and have a good day on the water. Um, but what I think is important to understand and, and is that in order to do that, it starts at the ground level. You have to have healthy reefs, to have healthy bait populations. And, and uh, you know, as I've learned a little in a little bit of time, I've gotten to spend talking about this, you know, oxygen levels, things like that, that we don't think about could dr dramatically affect the ability for you know, the three of us to do our job and, of course, Bill to have tourists here. I mean, all of that affects us, and that's what we have to wake up to. And since it is such an invisible threat, we've got to learn a lot more about it. And, you know, uh, obviously it's not going to change overnight, but, you know, that, this is the beginning, I think, and I'm happy to be a part of that. Excellent. And, Ernie, this is uh, one of my favorite questions, having met uh, Junior. Um, your children plan to also become commercial fishermen. What do you foresee for them as part of their of that future? What challenges will they face and what advantages will they have? Well, the advantages, we'll start out with that first. I think, you know, the between the management of their fisheries and the education from what I've seen since I've been fishing for 33 years has gotten so much better. The, you know, we're, we're on trap reductions. We're more eco-friendly. And I think that plays a big role in, you know, the advantages they're going to have. And plus, just meetings like this and educating people is a big advantage for our younger generation. And let me just point out, you know, I'm trying to start this generational fishing for our younger people who are coming out of the Keys and stuff. And because a lot of the guys are getting older and there's, it's hard to get in to the commercial fishing industry it, with the trap tags, with everything. So we're trying to promote, you know, a generational fishing program for the younger generation coming up to help get into the fishery. Because if we don't have a, a younger generation, we're not going to have a fishery that supplies quality seafood and fresh seafood to the state of Florida, to the tourism, to everybody here. So that's one of the things that they do have a positive. And what was the other question, Holly? Um, just kind of what do you foresee for them in the future, which you talked about. But what are, what are some of the challenges that they're going to face? Well, the ocean acidification that I'm just learning about, you know, and just um, the global warming, I think that has a lot to do with it. I think it... It affects our lobster harvest, and I think that was part of, you know, I had an average season last year, but other guys had a great season. I think in the Upper Keys, the waters got so hot and the lobsters go out to the deeper water. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's just different challenges. I mean, with the whole environment, I think that's going to be their biggest challenge and protecting their environment and doing things like that. Right. Audience, you ready? You fired up? Awesome. Okay. Let's go. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Talbert. Yes, ma'am. I was kind of surprised when you said you have no fishing numbers. 
And I thought that, you know, our beaches are only one part of our natural resources that we have in South Florida, in the, the greater Miami area. So in terms of promoting ecotourism, it would seem that fishing and going into the Everglades, Florida Bay, going off of Key Biscayne would be one of the, one of the attractions for tourists. So, uh, Well, ecotourism we know quite a bit about. We have our friends from the uh, national parks, Wave National Parks, uh, and uh, particularly the Germans love love the Everglades. So we do track that, and we do promote ecotourism, particularly in Europe. But uh, we haven't really tracked per se fishing uh, because people are coming for a vacation. We want to know why they came here. They come here for a lot, but they're coming for a vacation. That's the first set. Some come for business. We want to know where they stayed, what they spent, what they liked, what they didn't like, and then we know where they, what countries they came from, what countries, and we promote in those countries, so. I've got his card, don't worry, we're gonna work on that. <laughs> well, we're neighbors, I'm a neighbor of Ray's just down the street, and he's promised me free fish every That's day it. to come Go over right. and learn more about this. <laughs> I'm gonna see a lot of this guy. <laughs> You talked a little bit about education needs to happen the most, and you were thinking that um, the, the um, businesses that take people out to the water um, are a great way to, to educate folks. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that acidification is kind of a complicated issue to just mm -hmm. download in one soundbite. Yeah. Um, what do you have? What what tools would make it easier for folks like you to educate visitors? Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, you have to acknowledge, you know, we're, we're all of a, another generation, I'll say it politely, but the new generation that, that does all the, the work on my website and so on has taught me how much exposure and how much outreach you can get just from websites. So I would say just off the top of my head, one, one way might be linking uh, information from website to website. Social media. Social media. Social yeah. media. Yeah, that's the we short version. That? We can do yeah. that. That's great. Yeah, I mean, that's something I'd, I'd be happy to do because I am in, interested in, like, to Ernie's point, you know, I have three children also, and my boats are named after my daughter. So, you know, it's, a, it's an important part of our future. The children are the next step. And, of course, you know, a lot of things that faced us, uh, maybe I should say a lot of things that we didn't face growing up will face them. And so that's the, this is the first step of that. Can I segue real quick? Sure, of course. One point I'd like to add to what Ray just mentioned is, you know, for the longest time, and I've been, this has been in my mind for, you know, for the last 10 or 15 minutes that we've had this discussion, I felt like the invisibility of the reef was its best friend. Right. In that, you know, no one could see it, no one could access it, and if they dropped an anchor and hit it by chance, well, that's an acute trauma in that one spot, and, you know, the reef mm -hmm. is safe. Uh, in the Keys, they have mooring balls um, to help protect the reef. I, to be honest, I'm not sure what the net gain is on a mooring line or a mooring ball that has a boat fishing on it all day long. But anyway, I, I think that now we've kind of come to another point since the threat is something that's invisible already. Um, there has to be greater visibility to the general population about it. Um, the, the fact that it's kind of hard to find the reefs isn't going to really protect it anymore. Um, so at least from a dive standpoint, uh, samples of before and after coral. Uh, we, we have a placard up on our boat for the Rescue Reef Program that UM runs with Diego Lerman. Um, and again, you're probably preaching to the choir a little bit there because these are divers already. Um, however, we do have snorkelers, we do other outreach programs, so those types of things uh, would really would really help create some awareness. Excellent. Yes, ma'am. Hi, it's Kathleen again with Mahogany Youth. We are working on um, training young divers. Our goal is to have 1,500 divers, kids, in the water in the next five years. And you said you started with staghorn coral replacing. Any particular reason why and at what depth are you replanting that? Okay, that might be a question for Chris or Diego or Dalton or Stephanie, and none of them are here. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you my very, unless someone else wants to take that question, I'll, I'll give you the, my understanding of it. Um, uh, staghorn's a pretty uh, quick growing coral. Um, it's something that grows uh, relatively fast. It responds well to our water conditions here. 
Uh, they have nursery trees that we have in a designated area near some of our northern reefs. And um, it's something that seems to respond well to being uh, attached to the substrate on the coral floor. And you can see a change, I mean, within six months and a year after one stem that was two or three inches might be a colony the size of a softball. Um, so without, you know, with, with not much knowledge, that's the, the, the coral of choice, uh, it seems to be, for, for what they're doing. Yeah. That was excellent. Good job. Um, and Tripp is here. Tripp, raise your hand right behind you. He's with the um, Coral uh, Foundation, Coral Restoration Foundation. He's a good one to hit up maybe at lunch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Here's Tripp, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. No, you <laughs> nailed it. They're the <laughs> fastest growing coral. This grows to that in one year. Here's a picture of a tree. <laughs> so we'd love to have your kids come dive in the nursery. There's a, we had about a thousand volunteers come through. Yeah. Since I do want to kind of bring this up to my colleagues and, and maybe make this some kind of, you know, have some kind of statewide program, what, do you, what would you like to see Florida do besides education? Give me something more concrete. Let, let me, and, and yeah. the, the fishermen, let me, let me just say one, you know, I went online and looked at this, and I always like to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So I did see that the fossil fuels were the problem. It hasn't been, you know, it's like, like the elephant in the room, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that I'm doing my part. Since 07, I've driven a Prius, you know, <laughs> half electric uh, and half still fossil fuels. My other car is a, is a hybrid. So I think everybody needs to do every little bit of the, this. This thing is so big, I guess, none of us want to chip away at it. So I'm doing my part. And you know, we'll be part of the education as well. But any, how many people are driving hybrid cars? Not I. See, I mean, that's this is. This is, you know, once again, the elephant in the room. We can all do something about this. You know, we've got scientists here, but just let's all do a little piece. That's my, that's my for today. <laughs> Good job. If we could get those tankers to run on uh, electric, right? That, well, you know, I mean, look at, I mean, our, our office building has uh, plugs for the electric cars, and very soon, you, you read about it, we're not going to be having cars, you know. Uh, Uber is legal as of May 13th. In uh, May 13th, Uber is legal. In five years from now, I won't have a car. None of us will have a car. And then these driverless cars, I don't know about you, but that scares me to death. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. But we're not, and this whole thing is changing. But if fossil fuels is a problem, let's do our little pieces to tamp that down. Good note, good note. Um, Ernie or, or Ray, you know, is this something that we need to start having, you know, at our monthly meetings with, with the fisheries? You know, what are, do you want to start being, sharing the good or the bad news as it would be? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, in California, I fished a guy named uh, Jimmy Kingsmill. He's a crewman out there. He's actually a police officer, works part-time, but he's very involved in uh, environmental issues. And he, con he connected me to EPA Clean Diesel, and it's an <coughs> engine buyback program where you can take old, whether well, there's a, an EPA program to take old inefficient engines out of work boats because they're the, obviously the greatest users or consumers of fuel based on the number of days they're working mm -hmm. and, uh, and retrofit them with, with um, more energy efficient fuel, you know, more uh, uh, emission friendly engines. And I, I've been looking into it for a couple of years and the problem, I just showed Ernie one this morning, I got an update yesterday. It, I think the, the newest uh, approval is for tribal vehicles for the Indians. But it's, you know, it's been, I've, I've got one, one of my boats has now about 40,000 hours on an old engine that you can't buy anymore, right? Great engine, very reliable, but I would be willing to convert, especially if there was a program that would help me do that. Um, my engine costs about $70,000. It's hard to walk away from that engine. But um, my point is this, this program today up till now has not allowed um, approval for East Coast of the United States for because I've I've been looking I'm in I'm I'm in the market for it I've got three boats and that one boat has an old mechanical engine and so that's just a suggestion maybe you want a for tax you. incentive tax incentive yes yeah, a tax incentive and I think it's even a subsidy a subsidy, subsidy. that helps. Um, partner with the engine manufacturers and, and what they call is tier one, tier two, tier three. We've evolved now to tier three emission requirements. 
I'm tier one in my old boat, just to give you, just to kind of put it in perspective. So, you know, that's something that would help the fishermen to answer your question. And of course, once that program gets in place, that's where social media, mm -hmm. you know, community leaders in that, in, in, in that arena can help steer the, you know, some of the people who don't know about it to those, to those incentives. Holly, I think uh, the education thing's huge. I mean, if you talk to probably any commercial fisherman down there, I'm sure they don't know anything about ocean acidification. I mean, I didn't, and I don't know if we have to get some commercials out or, you know, it, with our fishing permits to send out what's going on, because I can assure you, and I'm going to bring it up at our next board meeting next month about putting put out there to all our board members what's going on with this, because I've been, I've learned a lot here today, and I appreciate this time and, you know, this session we're having, and the education is the main part. I mean, we got to teach people about it. People got to learn about it because a lot of people don't even know anything about it. They're like, oh, just, what is that? You know, I talked to Tom Hill yesterday, owner of Key Logger Fisheries. He had no idea what, what this was. So education is huge. That's awesome. And uh, we're going to have Congresswoman Ileana ross Layton in here at lunch. So maybe we can uh, hit her up about in extending that program to the East, mm -hmm. Host, East uh, Coast because I'm sure, Eric, you would probably – Take advantage of that, maybe mm -hmm. uh, you know, Absolutely. Ernie just yeah. changing over, having that, having that backup or that incentive to uh, to change over, because like Bill said, that is the the. But I think at the room. end of the day, don't just tell us what the problem is. Tell us how we can fix it. Yeah. Sure, and well, you know and then what? the other and, things. And so Rebuilding the reefs. But nobody told me how I could fix it. Yep. But, yeah. And so here's a, like a litmus test question, right? We, we everybody's aware of what happened on the Great Barrier Reef and the bleaching, and I mean, so if that were to happen here, how much press would it get? How much would it impact the kind of fabric of Florida or the commerce or the economy of Florida? I would argue much less press than what it's getting in what is considered, you know, the world's largest reef. And, and so I think, you know, it's one of those things of really getting people that are Floridians, the average Floridian, which I don't think is really anyone in the, in the room at the moment as far as their knowledge of this, and letting them know what, what impact it has. Because there's going to be different viewpoints. Fishermen. Uh, will see a reef as the structure that holds their livelihood, right? They'll see it as as long as I can get my. I'm just there's no. I'm just saying mm -hmm. as long as I can get you know my big uh, mutton tail. snapper off of it, then the reef's healthy. If the snapper keeps coming up, the reef's healthy. That may be an analog. That might be true. But another way of looking at it is from a diver and then also a snorkeling perspective. You know, it's hard to get uh, in in Key Biscayne and in Miami Beach, a snorkeling reef in six feet of water mm -hmm. where you could really show where this is happening. So that's really one of the, the kind of hurdles that, that needs to be addressed, I think. On that agreed, yeah. agreed. And if that happened in the Keys, my hair would certainly be on fire. So okay. don't worry, I'd spread that word. <laughs> okay. Ernie, to that. You know, it's all the, you know, things that are happening in the ocean. You know, it's like the, it was so hot. We talked about last summer. I mean, I seen a lot of bleaching when I was setting my traps last August. I mean, and you can still see the damages from it, you know, this year. I mean, I've, just this past month, we've been out there riding around, looking around, and we can see the damages from the bleaching. So it's, edu you know, educating, you know, the public and our younger generation on everything that's going on that we can do to protect this resource and the corals. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Beal. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here at the Rose and Steel School. And um, I wanted to make a comment following on uh, from what Mr. Talbot was saying about, you know, solutions. And I think uh, it really it comes down to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and driving our hybrids. Thank you very much. It's great to hear that people are doing that. Um, you know, here in South Florida, we have a lot of sunshine. And sunshine gives us a lot of energy. Um, and solar panels, for example, are already at what we call grid parity, which means that you can install and get uh, electricity from a solar panel for the same price that you get grid electricity from the mix of coal, oil, gas, and nuclear that we have presently in South Florida, for example, um, and throughout the country. The reason that we're not taking advantage of our solar energy uh, is largely because companies like Florida Power and Light don't provide any way for us to sell that energy back to the grid. So, you know, an example of how much difference that can make uh, in terms of uh, getting people to convert to solar and make their own electricity is that my, I, I originally come from the United Kingdom, I'm not a Florida native, and uh, my father there, who's 78 years old, put solar panels on his roof, um, and he gets a third less sunlight in the UK, you all know it rains, it <laughs> rains a lot there, um, and uh, you know, he was able to pay off those solar panels by selling back his electricity within eight years. 
Um, you know, so he installed them when he was 70 years old. He's now 78. He's conservative, by the way. He's very, very frugal with his money. Um, so I think this is an issue. You know, it doesn't seem like it's connected to ocean acidification, but, you know, educate people to petition FPL to allow us to sell back electricity to the grid, for example. This is one way that we could drastically reduce our carbon footprint here in South Florida and be part of the solution. So um, one of the things that the scientific community has been doing for a number of years is trying to um, learn from the lessons of other scientific issues that need to be broadcast to the public. Um, you know, fisheries issues or, or, or climate change or what have you. And um, the acidification community, sort of all the scientists thinking about all the different aspects of it who want to tell the world about this issue, um, have been trying to self-organize and come up with ways to link with community leaders, thought leaders from other sectors um, and to um, try to help create those educational bridges. And, I, and the, the Southeast um, is, is developing a coastal acidification network. I th is that the official name, Kim? Um, Southeast Ocean Ooh, and Coastal Acidification mouthful. Network. Right. Quite a mouthful. So can, for sure. Got it. So and um, one of the goals of these networks as they develop is to in engage uh, community and thought leaders to find out the best ways to partner on educational initiatives or policy initiatives even we're seeing a rise in the Northeast. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that that is in development and um, I'm sure, given that you all have been saying, boy, I'd like to know more about this issue, I have the feeling that you'll probably hear from that network again um, to try to create those bridges. Um, so I think, I think there, are, there are fledgling efforts um, afoot and certainly um, we would appreciate the steering that any community leaders could offer in terms of key participants or key needs. Excellent. Do we have time to let them uh, wrap up? Or do you have yeah. a question? Yeah. So, yeah, Sorry, I'll, I have one question for the group. So, in thinking about what you, we all heard this morning with the science panel, um, you know, there was a lot that was said that I had never heard, heard before and that gave me pause. So I'm just wondering if, if each of you can kind of reflect on, um, you know, what you heard this morning, you know, if anything, that really gave you pause and that you think you'll probably be bringing back to, you know, your colleagues in, in your corners of the world um, and, and, you know, making sure that people know about something in particular that, that you heard from the scientists this morning. Well, the threat to the coral reefs and the fishing, I mean, that's kind of the bottom line. I mean, you got to have threats. I mean, global warming, the icebergs, uh, you know, they're all going away and something, you know, you can see it. But uh, fishing is, is important, important in our community. And, uh, you know, the, the coral reefs is certainly, uh, certainly important. So those are, I mean, those are what we're known, we're known for, among other things. You, you don't want to affect something you're known for. That's, that's not a good thing. You know, if I, if I had one takeaway, uh, again, you know, I, this is all a nested system thing. You know, it's, it's a one big mechanism at play, whether it's global warming, uh, increased nutrients and outflows, uh, ocean acidification, uh, burning of fossil fuels. I was really interested in what Chris had to say about the the fossil fuel footprint of the CO2 and how much of that in the atmosphere is actually footprinted to human fossil fuel burning. Fingerprint. Yeah. Fingerprint, yeah. Um, so one thing I, w I would say is, you know, if you have a global warming here and ocean acidification here and uh, nutrient uh, pollution here, uh, people kind of get overwhelmed with like all this, you know, end of the world uh, bad news. And, and I'm wondering if there's any way to kind of follow the model that the planet has. Well, since it's all connected, can we somehow create this one connected view that people can digest? You know, um, so it, 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 in as much as through the different uh, people that are impacted as stakeholders, if we can create one message that kind of talks to all that and that can be digested, I think that would have a greater impact. On, on the people who we're, we're trying to influence with, with that. For sure. Um, I would say that I mirror your thoughts. You know, I, I'm in the same boat. You, you especially, you know, our lives are spent on the sea trying to focus on um, how to satisfy our guests and how to keep our boats running and how to operate safely and, uh, you know, just managing people. There's so many things that distract us from these issues that putting your, you're getting your head wrapped around the entire 
package of problems is important. Um, and one way that it, I, I think, simplifies it is the slides today that showed the, you know, 1970s coral and then a scene that shows it today. Any of that information that you can share with us that shows actual apples to apples <clears throat> is something that's, that uh, makes an impact on a simple-minded outdoorsman, whoever that is. You know, we're pretty simple in our thought process. We're not scientists, and yet you have to, you have to scale it down to a level that we can understand. I know that sounds like I'm saying we're a bunch of dummies, but anyways. But, you know, everybody has their strength, and our strength is maybe eyes and ears on the water, understanding and sharing what we know, what we can quantify. But simplifying the process, to your point, is a, is a really important thing. Ernie, do you want to wrap up? What I found interesting was, you know, how this is invisible and how you don't even know it's there and how it, it eats the coral from underneath and then it breaks off, you know, when a storm, when a big hurricane comes through. I found that really interesting about that. And I had a question I wanted to ask some of the scientists right now. What, as fishermen, you know, I'm, I'm a lobster and stone crabber mainly, can we see any of this coming th into the, like, on the lobsters or the crabs or anything? Is there anything that, how they're going to react to this that we can look for and help you guys with if we're seeing any of this? Are they going to have like six eyes or something? Um, I think most of the effects are on the, on the, on the larval stages. Right. So also the invisible part of the life cycle. I had heard something that it does affect, you know, the crustaceans and stuff like they'll, you know, you'll see a little bit of deformity somewhere here and there or something. Is, is that true that you can pick up on stuff like that? And will it show up in like the hardness of the shell? Because we're always, I, I have some recreational stone crab traps and you're always feeling for the soft ones. And it's possible. I don't are. actually know a lot about it, but yeah, they're, they're, their shell is strengthened by these mm -hmm. crystals. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, you know, you'll see a lobster or something, he'll come up with, you know, yeah. a, a different, the way his antenna goes or something, or a crab, you know, with it. And I didn't know if that was anything that was happening there through this. Any Acidification. I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, just, you know, coming out of the woodwork to acknowledge that I am actually an ocean acidification scientist and I've been tracking the literature for a long time. Um, we do know that some crustacean species from elsewhere in the country are affected. And we do know that the main effects at this point that have been uh, recorded are that the larvae take longer to grow up um, and less of them survive to grow up. And so it looks like the larval forms are the bottleneck. But um, we don't have any records yet of any deformities or changes in shell strength or anything like that. But that's not to say they don't happen. It's just to say that that research hasn't been done yet. And that research hasn't been done yet specifically on Florida species either. So personally speaking from, from where I stand, I would love to see that research done. And I think, um, the biological community is getting closer to doing those studies. We've seen Dungeness crab studies in the Pacific Northwest. We've seen um, studies on king and tanner crabs in Alaska that are showing these same trends. And I believe there's been an early study showing similar things for blue crab. But um, certainly for the spiny lobster here and stone crabs, we don't know yet. Well, thank you for that. To be, to be determined. And any way we can help you as an industry, you know, if you guys want to reach out to our organization, Florida Keys Commercial Fishermen's Association, we will be glad to help you guys with that. And I've been uh, helping the Rose and Steel School catch their dolphin and Kobe <coughs> with Ron Honig and John and so on. And uh, seems like that would be an easy, you know, way to test. You have, you know, contained, you have contained uh, habitat there. Seems, and if we ever need, you know, brood stock, let us know. Yes, Catherine. We work with a lot of kids. How can we use these kids as a resource to get the message out? Because our kids are very active on social media, and I think that might be a great way. Is there some way that we can produce maybe a blog or a piece that they can get out there? We, we had a, a kid from Mass Academy on one of our uh, outreach programs with you and bring his drone on board. We have drones. And, yeah, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> Again, I, uh, just celebrating my 42nd birthday, so drones are... Uh, so, anyway, the... Um, exactly, yeah. So, um, if I think it's a question of aligning something they find cool with what we find cool, and if you can let them use their cool stuff you know, to show things about, you know, related to us. So 
Um, UM does an incredible job with bringing uh, high school kids, uh, uh, underprivileged kids and groups out on, on all of these marine outreach programs. And uh, in as much as, as we can help in any way, because we've got big dive boats that hold 49 people, um, and with the, again, with Diego, uh, with Chris, or with, or with Neil, uh, I'm happy. I mean, that's why I'm here. So. Yeah, for the kids, don't have something they can't spell. Okay. <laughs> Remember the brand. Back Get a new brand. name. <laughs> Leave it to the, the, tourist, the chamber guy, right, to talk about the brand. Well, I think, um, are we going to wrap up here? And I know we have a really fun lunch ahead. And I just want to say what an incredible honor it was to take part in this and uh, to thank the Ocean Conservancy on, on putting this together. And um, I think that we've got um, a number of ways that we can at least move, move forward as, as industry stakeholders, as the science community, as the legislative community, to, uh, to see what we can do about OA. So thank you so much. Thank you.